This is Space Time Series 25, Episode 64, for broadcast on the 13th of June, 2022. Coming up on Space Time, a strange neutron star discovered in a stellar graveyard. NASA to begin launching rockets into space from Arnhem Land this month. And the world's biggest rocket, Artemis 1, back on the launch pad at Cape Canaveral. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have discovered a mysterious new type of neutron star. The star, which is catalogued as PSR J0901-4046, should be in a category for non-rotating dead neutron stars, assigned to a sort of hypothetical stellar graveyard. The trouble is, it's still rotating, very slowly, but the spin is still there, completing one rotation every 76 seconds and emitting an unusual radio signal. The discovery, reported in the journal Nature Astronomy, suggests the star could belong to a long-theorized class of ultra-long period magnetars, stars with extremely strong magnetic fields, and it even has characteristics associated with fast radio bursts, extremely powerful ultra-short flashes of energy, usually originating from distant galaxies. The study's lead author, Manisha Caleb, formerly from the University of Manchester and now at the University of Sydney, says the strange neutron star was detected from just a single pulse picked up by the Meerkat radio telescope in South Africa. Amazingly, Caleb and colleagues only detected radio emissions from the source for just 0.5% of its rotational period. But it was possible to confirm multiple pulses using simultaneous consecutive 8 second long images of the sky in order to confirm its position. The authors say they were lucky that the pulsar beam intersected directly with the Earth. Because the majority of pulsar surveys don't search for periods this long, Caleb and colleagues have no idea just how many of these stars could be out there. It's therefore likely that there could be many more of these slowly spinning neutron stars in the galaxy. And that would have important implications for understanding how neutron stars are born, evolve and age. Neutron stars are the crushdown stellar cores of massive stars far larger than our Sun. Only about 3,000 neutron stars have so far been detected in our galaxy. That makes them fairly rare. When stars reach the end of their lives on the main sequence, having fused most of the hydrogen in their core into helium, the balancing act between gravity crushing a star down towards its centre and nuclear energy pushing outwards ends, and gravity wins, causing the stellar core to collapse inwards under the star's own immense weight. Now all this mass crushing down on the core causes a dramatic increase in pressure and temperature there. Eventually, conditions get extreme enough to trigger a helium flash, in other words, making it hot enough for the core to begin fusing helium into carbon and oxygen. At the same time, a shell of hydrogen outside the core has now reached sufficiently high pressures and temperatures to also begin burning. And this increased heat causes the star's outer layers to expand. And because these outer layers are now further away from the core, they also cool down. This combination of expansion and cooling transforms the star into what astronomers call a red giant. Eventually, stars like our Sun will fuse most of their core helium into carbon and oxygen, but they don't have enough mass to fuse carbon and oxygen into heavier elements, and so the fusion process ends. Their outer gaseous envelope detaches and floats away as a planetary nebula, leaving the stellar core exposed as a white dwarf, which will slowly cool over the eons. However, stars between 8 and 20 times more massive than the Sun face a very different fate. Because they're so massive, with high core temperatures and pressures, they fuse carbon into helium through a different process. And they then go on to fuse progressively heavier and heavier elements. Carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, neon, magnesium, silicon, sulfur, nickel, and eventually iron. But no matter how massive a star is, it's not massive enough to fuse iron into heavier elements. 
and so the balancing act between gravity crashing the star down towards its centre and nuclear energy pushing outwards reaches a final conclusion, with gravity again being the winner and causing the star to collapse in a spectacular explosion known as a core collapse supernova. Now, for stellar cores greater than about 1.44 times the mass of the Sun, figure known as the Chandrasekhar limit, this immense gravitational collapse is so great it breaks through what's known as electron degeneracy. That's the quantum mechanical effect arising from the Pauli exclusion principle, which prevents more than one fermion, such as an electron, from being in the same minimum energy level quantum state at the same time. Instead, it allows even further collapse, crushing the negatively charged electrons and positively charged protons together to form neutrons, hence the star's name. Although only a dozen or so kilometres wide, neutron stars are the densest objects in the known universe, other than black holes. In fact, just a sugar cube size of neutron star material would weigh 100 million tonnes. Neutron stars are thought to be composed of a solid, rigid outer crust or shell composed primarily of ions and electrons. Now, directly below this is theorised to be a fluid in a crust made up of electrons, neutrons and atomic nuclei, a neutron-proton Fermi fluid and electron-Fermi gas outer core, and an inner core possibly composed of quark-gluon plasma. At least that's the theory. Caleb says the newly discovered neutron star seems to have at least seven different pulse types, some of which occur at regular intervals. It's the beginning of a new class of neutron star. She says how or whether it relates to other classes is yet to be explored. So a neutron star is an extremely dense remnant that's left over after a massive star undergoes a supernova explosion. The neutron stars are typically about 20 kilometers across and a teaspoon of neutron star material would weigh about 4 billion tons on Earth. And what you guys have found using Meerkat in South Africa appears to be a neutron star. It's, it's rotating. Neutron stars often rotate. They rotate because of the conservation of angular momentum. As they contract, they rotate faster and faster because they start out, as you said, as regular stars. But eventually they get old and that rotational rate slows down. And this is where your discovery comes in. It's showing a number of things, isn't it? That's right. So the thing of what makes our star unique is that it rotates extremely slowly. So it completes one rotation every 76 seconds. And basically, when neutron stars are born, they have very short rotation periods. And as they age, uh, because they dissipate energy, they slow down and they attain longer periods. But the thing is, when they attain longer periods, you don't expect them to emit in the radio anymore. And our neutron star resides in what we call the neutron star graveyard. So it has past what we um, astronomers call the death line, and it's in the graveyard where we don't expect any emission at all. But we do see emission. So this is quite interesting because we either don't understand the neutron star graveyard or we don't understand how neutron stars evolve. When you say rotate very fast, we're talking about millisecond speeds, aren't we? We're talking about many times a second in some cases. Absolutely, yes. So the shortest known neutron star rotates with a spin period of about 1.4 milliseconds. And until our discovery came along, the longest spin period was 23.5 seconds. So ours is considerably longer than the slowest known neutron star until ours came along. What's the hypothesis? What do you think is causing this star to still give out bursts in the radio at such a slow rotational rate? So that's the thing we don't quite know, and it's something for the theorists uh, to explore. But what is extremely interesting about our source is that it exhibits seven different types of pulses. So there are seven different varieties of shapes of uh, the single pulses that the source emits. And that's quite diverse given what we've seen in the other 3,000 known neutron stars in our own galaxy. And there's one particular type of pulse which is quasi-periodic in nature. So it basically means there are several short-duration pulses uh, closely packed. And we speculate that this could be caused by seismic vibrations or 
dark wakes on the surface of the neutron star, which could be providing us with very valuable insight into the actual extreme physics that's producing the emission. But we don't really know what this emission is just yet. There's a lot about neutron stars we don't understand. We're not sure about what's happening deep inside them. Are they uh, quark stars deep inside? Who knows? You're finding some interesting clues. It could be a magnetar or, or even a fast radio burst. That's really interesting, isn't it? Absolutely. So even though this is uh, the spin period and what we call the period derivative, which is the rate at which uh, the neutron starts slowing down, is characteristic of pulsars, the single pulse shape is very reminiscent of magnetars. And also the, um, uh, the magnetic field that is associated with the source is extremely high, which again is characteristic of magnetars. So we're still not sure, the jury is still out on whether this is a high magnetic field pulsar or a magnetar. And we're going to need more observations at different wavelengths uh, to understand which category this belongs to or whether it is in a category of on its own. But the quasi-periodic pulses are particularly interesting because we've seen some fast radio bursts uh, exhibit similar pulses. And... But whether our source exhibits the same sort of energies that fast radio bursts emit is something that we haven't uh, seen yet. So continued monitoring of the source will tell us whether it is indeed capable of producing the same sort of large amounts of energy that is typically seen in a fast radio burst pulse. We're now seeing this emergence of neutron stars with magnetars and fast radio bursts. That's sort of the way other observations are going too, especially with fast radio bursts and what they're likely to be, because right now they're still a mystery. But the more we find out about them, especially with fast radio bursts that are repeating, we're finding out that they seem to hang around in the same sort of neighbourhoods as where you'd expect characteristics for magnetars to be. And now we're seeing uh, uh, another example here of something which sort of fits into the broad group. Because most theories for what fast radio bursts could be uh, based on our observational characteristics uh, tend to be, like most theories, which can quite elegantly account for all that we observe are magnetars. And the fact that we see FRB-like pulses from this particular source, uh, at least in terms of the pulse shapes, suggests that this could maybe produce um, FRBs in the future. And it also suggests that maybe there is some sort of an evolutionary link between magnetars and fast radio bursts, which occur well outside our galaxy. I guess we're going to have to observe this source more to figure out whether there is indeed a link. That's got to be exciting. That is indeed very exciting. So where to next? You talked about looking at it, other areas of the electromagnetic spectrum and also I guess you're looking for more? Yes, I think this is just the beginning because right now this particular neutron star is off in a little class of its own and there are potentially hundreds more of these sources just waiting to be discovered. Uh, I think upcoming and future plans to search for more such objects will really help us understand uh, the galactic neutron star population a bit better and also potential links to fast radio bursts or even other types of neutron stars. Until now, you did know this was there, so you didn't know what to look for. Now you know it's there, you're going to be looking for more of them. Exactly. I think that's what astronomy is all about. You're exploring or finding the unknown unknowns. A lot of these discoveries are serendipitous and then you've discovered that there indeed are more out there. You just need to look for them. Meerkat's been wonderful for this sort of thing, hasn't it? Absolutely. Meerkat is the precursor to the square kilometre array, which is going to be the future of radio astronomy. And the fact that we're finding such exciting objects with Meerkat just shows what the future SKA is capable of. That's Manisha Caleb from the University of Sydney. And this is Space Time. Still to come, NASA to begin launching rockets from Arnhem Land this month and the world's biggest rocket, Artemis One, back on the launch pad at Cape Canaveral. All that and more still to come on Space Time.
NASA's listed June the 26th as the preferred launch window for the first of three sounding rocket flights to be conducted from Equatorial Launch Australia's new Arnhem Space Centre in the Northern Territory's Gove Peninsula near Nolomboy. The flights will be the first for NASA from a commercial launch facility outside the United States. And it'll be the first time the American agency has launched rockets in Australia since 1995. Back then, launches were conducted from the Australian Air Force's Woomera rocket range. As part of the current program, two more suborbital missions will launch from Arnhem on windows opening on July the 4th and July 12th. Now, two of the flights in this campaign will focus on studying Alpha Centauri A and B, the two primary stars in the three-star Alpha Centauri system. Alpha Centauri is the nearest star system to the Sun and can be best seen from the Southern Hemisphere. In fact, if you look at the Southern Cross, Alpha Centauri is the more distant of the two pointer stars. The third launch will focus on studying X-rays emitting from the interstellar medium, the space between the stars. The three flights will each be launched aboard a 12.2-metre-tall Canadian two-stage Black Brant 9 sounding rocket flying a suborbital apogee of 300 kilometres. The Black Brant's no stranger to Australia, having first flown from the Woomera rocket range back on November 9, 1976. That was part of a joint Australian and Canadian program to study the Earth's ionosphere. Later, NASA also launched a number of Black Brants from Woomera. Back in September 2021, around 20 NASA personnel from the Wallops Island Flight Facility on the Virginia Mid-Atlantic Coast travelled to Arnhem Land to set up equipment for the current campaign. Another 60 NASA staff arrived last month, with a further 15 science team members flying in this month. Nikki Fox, director of NASA's Heliophysics Division in Washington, D.C., says the flights will allow scientists to explore how a star's light can influence a planet's habitability. The first launch, targeted for June the 26th, will carry an X-ray quantum calorimeter developed by the University of Wisconsin-Madison. It uses unique X-ray detectors, cooled to just one twentieth of a degree above absolute zero and used to measure interstellar X-rays with unprecedented precision to better understand the interstellar medium and its influence on the structure and evolution of galaxies and stars. The second mission, that's the one slated for the 4th of July, will carry a suborbital imaging spectrograph for transition region of radiance from nearby exoplanet host stars, in this case Alpha Centauri A and B. Developed by the University of Colorado Boulder, it'll study the ultraviolet light from these stars and how it affects the atmospheres of planets around them, including the gases thought to be signs of life. The third mission, targeted for launch on July the 12th, will carry JUICE, the Dual Channel Extreme Ultraviolet Continuum Experiment, also from the University of Boulder, Colorado. JUICE will measure a so far understudied part of the extreme ultraviolet spectrum. These measurements will help astronomers model stars similar and smaller than the Sun, as well as better understand their effects on planetary atmospheres. Located just 12 degrees south of the equator on the Gulf of Carpentaria, the Arnhem Space Centre is ideally suited for equatorial missions, and its management hopes to ramp up operations over the next five years. Equatorial Launch Australia is already in advanced commercial discussions with nine other major rocket companies. They hope to carry out at least two additional launches before the end of this year, eventually ramping up to more than 50 launches a year by 2025. As well as Equatorial Launch, works proceeding on three other commercial space launch facilities. Southern Launch are developing a polar launch facility at Whaler's Way on the Air Peninsula near Port Lincoln. It would provide orbital launches over the Great Southern Ocean while a second southern launch facility near Kanimba, 40 kilometres from Sejuna on the South Australian west coast, would track over the Nullarbor, allowing test rockets to be fired with the jettison stages and payloads then collected. Meanwhile, construction is now underway on the Bowen Space port at Abbott Point in North Queensland, and it'll be used for orbital launches by Gilmore Space Technologies' new Ares rocket. This is Space Time. Still to come... The world's biggest rocket, NASA's SLS Artemis One, is back on the launch pad at Cape Canaveral. And later in the science report, the world's first exascale supercomputer and the world's largest and oldest plant. All that and more still to come on Space Time.
NASA's SLS Artemis 1 moon rockets back on the launch pad in Florida after a series of modifications in preparation for another attempt at a pre-launch wet dress rehearsal. It took about 10 hours for the massive 98 meter tall rocket to travel the 6.8 kilometers from the vehicle assembly building at the Kennedy Space Center to the neighboring Space Launch Complex 39B at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Base aboard its crawler transporter. A new attempt at the wet dress rehearsal is now slated for June 19th. These tests are designed to demonstrate that the SLS can be safely loaded with propellant and oxidizer, carry out a series of launch aborts, and still lift off safely. Previous wet dress rehearsals back in April were aborted following a series of issues with ground equipment on the launch pad, including valve, fueling, and leak issues. Engineers addressed the liquid hydrogen system leaks in the tail service mast umbilical on the mobile launch pad, which was connected to the interim cryogenic propulsion stage. It seems it's common for no leaks to show up at normal air temperatures, but then develop once cryogenic temperatures are established. The solution is simply tightening the umbilicals at regular intervals. Technicians also replaced an interim cryogenic propulsion stage gaseous helium system check valve and support hardware, modifying the umbilical purge boots responsible for the quick disconnect of the mobile launch pad arms from the SLS during liftoff. They found a small piece of rubber was preventing the valve from sealing properly. Now, there's nothing wrong with the valve itself, but mission managers wanted to know where the bit of rubber came from. They also checked the Orion spacecraft itself just to make sure it was okay following exposure to the thunderstorms and heavy rain which deluged the Cape Canaveral launch complex during the April test. While they were at it, they also updated software on the spacecraft in order to address issues encountered during core stage cryogenic tanking of both the liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen during the April test. And contractors looking after the gaseous nitrogen system at the launch complex have also completed a series of upgrades. Now, there was nothing broken on the nitrogen system, which is used to purge the rocket, including its umbilical plates. But the 2,608-ton SLS is so big, it needs far more gas nitrogen, and the existing system was finding it difficult to meet the demand. So, extra capacity was added. Engineers have also undertaken some of the forward work originally stated to take place in the vehicle assembly building after the wet dress rehearsal was complete. This includes installing hardware elements for the Callisto technology demonstration, a flight kit locker and assemblies for a space biology experiment. The upcoming wet dress rehearsal should take about 48 hours. It includes a full countdown simulation, which will see the rocket initiate all pre-flight systems and cycle right through all fueling procedures right up to the moment just before engine ignition. The test also includes a series of holds and several launch aborts. They're designed to test systems and stress components under several different simulated weather scenarios and launch conditions. The rehearsal will run the Artemis 1 launch team through operations to load propellant into the rocket's tanks, conduct a full launch countdown, demonstrate the ability to recycle the countdown clock, and also drain the tanks to give them an opportunity to practice the timelines and procedures that they'll have to use during launch. The launch team will start by activating the facilities needed to launch and formally begin the countdown sequence. Teams at the Launch Control Center at Kennedy will connect with staff at Mission Control at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, the Space Force Eastern Range Administration, and the SLS Engineering Support Center at the agency's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. Launch controllers will power on different rocket and spacecraft systems along with ground support equipment. They'll then load more than 2,650 tons of cryogenic propellants, including both liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, into the SLS core and upper stages at the launch pad while the rocket's on the mobile launcher following a detailed timeline identical to the one they'll actually use on launch day. They'll practice every phase of the countdown, including weather briefings, pre-planned holds in the countdown, conditioning and replenishing of propellants as needed, and validation checks. During the wet dress rehearsal, once launch controllers reach the point just before the rocket's RS-25 engines ignite on the launch pad, they'll stop and recycle back to the T-10 minute point, and then resume the countdown once more after a hold. 
Mission managers will then deliberately halt the countdown about 10 minutes before simulated liftoff in order to demonstrate stopping a launch and draining the propellants from the rocket. Launch controllers may decide not to proceed with a launch if a technical or weather issue arises during or prior to a countdown, so demonstrating the ability to remove propellants will ensure teams are prepared for various launch day scenarios. Several days after the wet dress rehearsal, Artemis 1 will be rolled back into the vehicle assembly building. Their technicians will remove a series of sensors specifically used for monitoring during the wet dress rehearsal. They'll then charge Orion and other system batteries, stow late load cargo into Orion and run final checkouts on several systems. NASA then will review data from the rehearsals before setting a specific target launch date for the Artemis 1 mission. Orion and the SLS will then roll back out onto the launch pad for the final time. Now, if all goes well during this window launch period, Artemis 1 should fly during a launch window opening on August the 10th, in the process becoming the most powerful object ever to lift off the Earth's surface and producing some 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust. Its 25-day maiden voyage will be an unmanned test flight taking it some 65,000 kilometers beyond the Moon in retrograde orbit. The mission will carry several experimental payloads aboard the Orion capsule and will deploy 13 six-unit CubeSats along the way before returning to Earth and splashing down in the North Pacific Ocean. Now, if the mission goes according to plan, Artemis II will follow in 2024. That'll carry the first manned Orion crew capsule on a 10-day mission around the Moon and back. This would be followed in 2025 by Artemis III, which would return humans to the lunar surface on what's expected to be a 30-day mission. This is Space Time. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. The Oak Ridge National Laboratory has revealed the world's first exascale supercomputer. An exaflop is a billion billion operations per second. Called Frontier, the $600 million computer processes some 1.1 exaflops, or 1.1 quadrillion operations per second, making it the world's fastest supercomputer and a million times quicker than your average high-end gamer laptop. Frontier is being clocked at speeds of 1,685 exaflops. Its storage component, called Orion, can hold up to 700 petabytes of data. Frontier uses a combination of 94,064 core CPUs and 37,000 M1250X GPUs, all housed in 74 separate rack cabinets. This massive machine will be used to resolve complex scientific problems such as accurate climate modeling, nuclear fusion solutions, protein folding and drug discovery. Scientists have discovered what they now believe to be the world's largest and oldest single plant. It's a giant seagrass mat discovered in the shallow sun-drenched Indian Ocean waters of Western Australia's Shark Bay. Findings reported in the Journal of the Proceedings of the Royal Society B suggest that this one single plant covers an area of some 180 square kilometres and is some 4,500 years old. Scientists made the discovery while trying to determine how genetically diverse the Posidonia australis seagrass meadows were. And they were surprised to find that it was all just one big plant, making it the largest known plant on Earth. Hey, if you get a chance, check out The Expanding Black Hole, the latest online optical illusion designed to fill people's brains. Tests showed that the graphic reported in the journal Frontiers of Human Neuroscience makes around 86% of people feel like they're falling into a hole. The illusion's so good at deceiving human brains, it even prompts your pupils to dilate, as if you were really moving into a dark area. The study's authors from the University of Oslo say it shows that your pupils react to how we perceive light, even if this light is imaginary, like in this illusion. And so it's not just the amount of light energy that's actually entering the eye. 
And now to the most ridiculous story of the week. To paraphrase the immortal NASA astronaut and mission payload specialist Howard Wallowitz from Big Bang Theory, people who believe they were abducted by aliens are great. It means they're gullible and open to a little probing. Which brings us to the story of the person who claims to have become pregnant after being abducted by an alien and subjected to medical experiments aboard their spaceship. Now, we've been debating as to whether this was more Scully from X-Files or the big giant head from Third Rock from the Sun. Either way, the reports provided in a declassified Pentagon document obtained under a Freedom of Information request to the Defense Intelligence Agency. Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptic says the file was part of over 1,500 pages of DIA documents related to the Pentagon's secretive UFO program, the Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program. The story is that uh, the Sun newspaper in the UK did a freedom of information search requirement under the US Defence Intelligence Agency to try and find out what the results are of their investigations into the impacts and uh, effects of UFO encounters. Yeah, they run run the range of all sorts of things, you know, significant odours and skin sores and burns and strange probing feelings perhaps, but um, the interesting ones is uh, sexual encounters, including one and this is one out of several thousand reports that was a woman was pregnant from a UFO encounter now, it's the only one, uh, that's the only one example amongst these sort of thousands of uh, other um, symptoms, etc., or results of UFO encounters. But of course, that's the one that got the publicity because it's sort of, it's strange. It's, it's, it's more sort of, and there is actually a close encounter of, I think it's the sixth time, or the seventh or eighth, which is about uh, sexual encounters with, with aliens. Well, that's all you about know. the human alien hybrid, so that that's the one. Uh, yeah. the aliens could survive on Earth uh, under Earth like conditions. This is, one, is this episode of The X Files, you must have seen it. Yes, I know it's X-Files, and, yeah, but this person who was, this woman who was pregnant, there's no indication that anyone followed up. Now, I thought that would be pretty interesting to see what the result of a human-alien hybrid is, um, but no one seems to have followed up. It's a report, in other words, and they have, this body was looking into reports, and some of them, it's very unclear as to how many they actually investigated, but I mean, it's hundreds and hundreds of um, cases and a lot of them, most of them unpublished where humans had been injured after anomalous encounters. So unpublished I don't know if that means the source is not clear and this is what I'd like to know. Did they just collate them and say well yeah this person said they got pregnant. How much research did they do and what was the outcome and this, you'd think that someone who was uh, pregnant from an alien would be followed closely to see what the outcome would be but no it's just a reference to someone got pregnant you know, a name rash assumption Mary, was it? no I don't know I don't even get the name I know that'd be interesting um, but uh, yeah so and then how do they explain I'm pregnant or oh, it's it's, it's not Billy Bob down the road. It's uh, it's an alien. So yeah, in this in this uh, report of the hundreds of cases that the the American body investigated, which is no longer exists, this American body, like most American bodies that investigate UFOs, they last for a while, then they disappear. That uh, it's just one case in which we got pregnant, and that seems to be it. I'd really like more evidence of it. Thank you. I think we demand more evidence. We need I, to know. I want to see what comes out. <laughs> That's what I mean. I mean, you, you sit there and wait. Right? And it's, it's the, you know, how long is a human-alien hybrid pregnancy, for instance? I'm always fascinated by how the, um, the the junk of the alien and the junk of the human always match up, where you'd think in real <laughs> life that wouldn't be the case. Yes, I mean, they have two eyes, which is understandable, but a lot of animals have more than two eyes. Yes. Yeah, and, um, Jellyfish. Two eyes, nose, mouth, eyes, yeah. two arms, two legs. Gee, they look a lot like us. <laughs> That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcast, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from Spacetime with Stuart Gary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. 
Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more Space Time, please check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel, and on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 